Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Eric Bersano, and I'm going to be interviewing Mark O'Mara on the Derek Chauvin trial uh, that is already underway. Uh, quick introduction of Mark. He is a board certified criminal trial attorney uh, and also a civil rights attorney. So I can't think of a more perfect guest for this interview uh, since this, this involves both the criminal trial of Derek Chauvin and the civil rights case of George Floyd. Uh, Mark, if uh, if you don't mind, kind of give us your opinion overall of what you're seeing going on so far, especially concerning this $27, $27 million uh, civil suit that was just awarded during jury selection. Well, it's interesting because this, like many other high profile cases, you know, there's always going to be some glitches along the way, but there are glitches that the trial attorneys and more importantly, the trial judge are going to try real hard to minimize. You know, you want you don't want problems with the air conditioning, right? You don't want problems with the lights. You don't want those things that you can control. You need to because, you know, everyone in this case, the entire nation, the entire world is going to be looking at this case to see what we are going to do with these facts, with this video. So with that as a backdrop. Now we have to look at those issues that you would never think would come up. I'll give you the example. One of them is that the judge throws out the third degree murder charge, believing that under that state's law that um, Chauvin would have had to do something to more than one person. That was sort of an interpretation of the law. Then the appellate court comes back and says, no, no, no. We look at this other case where it was a third degree murder conviction against a cop, coincidentally, for an event against one person. So now that third degree murder charge can stand in the Chauvin case. But that doesn't happen until jury selection has already begun. Defense counsel comes up and says, hold on a second. Don't, don't be too fast about this. We may take this to the Supreme Court, who may say once again the third degree murder charge does not apply. So now you've got this entire complication of a case that jury selection has already begun and literally the jurors don't necessarily know what charges they are to consider. Now, in that part of it, okay, that can sort of be fixed. You go back in and tell the jurors that you've already spoken to, by the way, there's this other case, this is other charge. Uh, and, and that's somewhat fixable, although again, a glitch you know the trial judge which wishes that he didn't have to deal with. Great, so we sort of wild our way through that and continue with jury selection. And then lo and behold, in you know a couple of days later, three days later, you have the announcement of a $27 million civil settlement in favor of the Floyd family. Uh, again, nothing that this trial judge would ever have wanted to have dealt with because they, we, are trying so hard to do what is supposed to happen in any criminal case, which is only decided on the facts and the law that you get in the courtroom. We all know that there may be evidence out there that we have heard about it as members of the public, but will never get into a courtroom because it's hearsay or it's not well-founded or it's not relevant uh, to the issues at hand. And yet, now this judge, has to go back into those very jurors, now seven of them that were selected up until yesterday or maybe this morning. And now he has to go in and talk to them and say, have you heard about this extraneous fact, the $27 million verdict, that is particularly potentially prejudicial um, in that if I'm sitting as a juror, I may say, well, the city has already admitted he's guilty because they paid an enormous amount of money. And let's remember, that's the most amount of money that has been paid by settlement in a civil rights case against law enforcement in our history. So it is significant. And a juror will sit back and go, what are we doing here? It seems as though he's already admitted guilt or his agency has admitted guilt. Now, we in the legal profession know the standard is much different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a settlement uh, on a civil case really doesn't have a lot of impact or shouldn't have a lot of impact on a criminal case, completely different standards, and quite honestly, different factors that are to be considered. 
But well, I've also, I was going to say, I've also heard the counter argument, which was interesting, which is, well, if the family's already received this $27 million, yeah. maybe that's good enough. Maybe we don't have to charge him as yeah. much, which might weigh on. Is that a consideration as well? And it really is, because I was going to say, that's the other side of the coin. You have jurors sitting there going, he's already guilty. And you have other jurors saying potentially, well, wait a minute. Family's been compensated. $27 million is an enormous amount of money. Um, you know, we sort of balanced the scales already here, haven't we? So why are we going to potentially throw this cop, already a difficult task for any juror to undertake, why are we going to throw this cop in prison when it looks as though the scales have somewhat been balanced? So yes, it's we don't know which way it's going to fall, and unfortunately, is going to fall slightly differently on each of those 12 jurors who are hearing this case to the extent that they know about that civil settlement. And again, one of those variables, one of those extraneous facts that we as criminal defense attorneys don't want to deal with and the trial judge doesn't want to either. Right. Now, it's interesting because we're, we're not even through jury selection yet. And there's already been two, what I think would be considered major issues that aren't normal. One of them is the third degree was out by the judge, now it's back in, now you've got this $27 million uh, settlement. In any type of high profile case like this, the question on everybody's mind is, can he get a fair trial? And I think that's what the judge is trying really hard to do right now is, you know, you mentioned some things that, you know, you wanna make sure the air conditioning's right, you wanna make sure that, you know, the climate is right. But when there's something that's getting this type of national attention, what can be done to ensure a fair trial is, is going to take place? Well, a, a number of things the judge can try. Obviously, the ongoing, and you will see as the trial is undertaken daily, if not you know lunchtime as well, instructions to the jury not to listen or talk to anyone about this case outside of the courtroom. That we do that in all cases. And there are some cases um, where a jury, as was in the OJ case, where the jury was sequestered for the entire trial. You literally say, we're going to keep you, I, I don't make light of it saying this way, we're gonna keep you in jail, we're gonna keep you sequestered for the entire trial so that we can then better sequester you, better keep you away from the undeniable influences that are gonna happen out there. So there's that potential. Sometimes judges will just do it during jury deliberation. That's what happened in the Zimmerman case, for example. Um, so you know, there's different ways to, to address this and try and minimize it. Um, gag orders, of course, in place that, that the uh, parties and the lawyers don't talk to the media. There's different ways to address it, but it's going to be an enormous undertaking because 20 or 30 years ago it was pretty easy. You know, what was the what was the the instruction? Don't read the paper, right? right. Maybe don't watch the two or three channels on TV. Now uh, everyone has you know the gateway to every piece of information in the universe. It's called Google or the internet, uh, and it's almost impossible because we have now become default animals to look at our phone and to see what's going on in the world. And that's going to be a difficult task for this judge. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because information is is literally at the, at the tip of our fingers uh, at any time that we want it. Uh, this has obviously taken on uh, a completely different life. I mean, there's been protests. Uh, people are voicing themselves on Twitter. It's almost impossible to say that you haven't been influenced one way uh, or to say that you haven't seen information about this. So one of the things that the defense, I think, is asking for is a change of venue, which I understand why, but would that even be an advantage to the defense considering how ubiquitous this, this case has become? So again, in days gone by, a change of venue was a good maneuver to try to avoid publicity, right? It was like, well, it's happened in, for example, it's happened in Orlando. So let's move it to Miami or to Tallahassee or to Jacksonville because there's not as much coverage there. And that 20, 30 years ago made some sense. Mm -hmm. The problem with it, and the same problem that we faced in, in the Zimmerman case, was there was no reason to try and move that case to another county in Florida because there was no county in Florida 
there was no county in the country that didn't have as much information as Seminole County, the county of its initial venue. And the same thing, quite honestly, in this case, I, I don't believe that the defense actually has as a premise that they will get an unbiased panel in some other county. But I do think that it might have been a strategic move, if convicted, to have yet another basis for an appeal to say, dear judge, we told you we couldn't get a fair trial here. We told the, the trial judge that. They, they made us stay. So in an abundance of caution, overturn the conviction, if that's what happens, mm -hmm. and let us try this case again in some far distant county. Uh, it is a, a maneuver that often is taken on by the defense, sometimes with really good reasons. Um, but in today's day and age, with a high profile case, and this is one of the highest, you're not going to get anywhere where someone doesn't know about this case. And quite honestly, you don't want those people on your jury if you found people who didn't know about this case. Right. So the other interesting piece in this is there were three other officers involved. So, you know, Derek was obviously the person who was uh, had the knee on the back of George Floyd's neck. Then you had three other officers that are all look like they're going to be charged um, in, in some way or another. Is it an advantage for the Chauvin trial to go uh, through first? Or if, if you were the defense attorney, what would you think? Well, it's really, it's one of those double-edged swords. Um, I, if I was representing one of the other officers, I would be very happy that Chauvin case is going first, particularly if he's convicted. Because if he's convicted, then I, on behalf of my secondary defendant, the uh, one of the other officers, would say, look, he's the one who did it. Uh, he's the one who was found guilty. Yes, I was there, but I had no knee on his neck. And, you know, there's this thought that if if the system um, gets its pound of flesh, uh, to call it that, by a Chauvin conviction, then there'll be less of a fervor over the other ones. Now, if I'm representing Chauvin, um, I'd much rather go last for a couple of reasons. One, I then get one, two, or three free per, uh, previews of what the state is going to present. You're going to hear from the witnesses. You're going to hear from the experts. You're going to have all of that information available to you as potential cross-examination of those very same witnesses by the time they get to me. So if I had my magic wand and I was representing Chauvin, I would want to probably go last to get all of that Imagine the amount of information flow you're going to have from three previous trials of witnesses who say, you know, the light was green today, but they say it was yellow in the next trial. Um, enormous amount of impeachment, which would, of course, benefit the defendant in a case like this. So if I could do it, if I was representing Chauvin, I'd go last. If I was representing one of the other ones, let Chauvin go first, um, you know, to the extent that there are tactical advantages in that way. And, and as the trial progresses, which we're, we're quickly approaching, there's going to be some strategies by the defense. And one question in a, in a case like this is always, will the defendant himself take the stand? Now, I know you're not privy to all the information that, that his trial attorney has, but what's your opinion on, on that in this case? So should a criminal defendant ever take the stand? Um, if it was a true or false law school exam question, uh, do you put your client on the stand? The answer is no. And the reason is sort of simplistic. Your client has an extraordinary amount of constitutional protections as a criminal defendant. And that is, he can never, he or she can never be compelled to testify against him or herself. These, the whole standard that we have in the criminal justice system, people don't really understand because it's somewhat unique. The system is set up where the, the prosecution and the prosecution alone always carries the burden. If they cannot prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, they do not deserve their conviction. If a good defense attorney can file motions, motions to exclude evidence, motions to do whatever they can to weaken the state's case, that is the way the system is set up. That saying where they said always, you know, we'd rather let 100 guilty men go free than to incarcerate one innocent man. It's really one of the precepts that we have that says, if the state can't prove it, they don't get their conviction. 
if they cop didn't do it right, if they broke into the car without permission, if they broke into the house, if they lied about something, if the witnesses don't tell the truth. So if you think about that as a premise, then the question is, should a defendant take the stand? He doesn't have to because it's the state's burden to prove. Mm -hmm. But having said that, in a self-defense case, for example, and I do a lot of that type of self-defense work, if you don't put your client on the stand to say, I acted in self-defense, I did it because I had to, I was in, in that case, reasonable fear of great bodily injury, which is what allows you to use deadly force. If you don't have a, your client say that to the jury, um, it's very difficult for the jury to then believe or to find that you acted in self-defense. In this case, um, it is very dangerous to put Chauvin on the witness stand because somehow, and I don't know how, somehow he's gonna to have to explain to that jury in a compelling way, both in his direct examination, most importantly in response to what's going to be vicious cross-examination of him were he to take the stand, why he thought that that was proper for those eight minutes and 46 seconds for him to keep his knee on George George's neck, George Floyd's neck, um, even after he seemed to have gone limp because I don't know how Chauvin is going to explain a way that there was not some other alternative, some other possibility for him to have done something other than what led to George Floyd's death. And although he almost has to get on there and say something like, I was, I was, I was trained to do it this way, I did it this way because I had to, I, I had no, I had no ill intent in my heart. I had no hatred, ill will, you know, what is third degree murder? I had none of that. All I was trying to do was keep control over the circumstances. He has to say something like that. And if you really think about it, with that video as one piece of evidence, the only way Chauvin walks away from this with less than a massive sentence is if this jury somehow believes from his mouth that he only did this because he felt he had to. Yeah, the, the one thing that I think is, so, and I, and I wanna hear your opinion on this, obviously, the, his defense seems like, well, let's just say that he was following the letter of the law in the technique, which, which I've, I've heard that argument. The technique right. was the letter of the law. I think the damning thing for him is the defiance. You know, you've got a crowd telling him, let him up, you're killing him. And the body language is like a defiance. Now, it's, it's, it doesn't look like he's in fear for his life. It doesn't look like George Floyd, it, obviously, at a certain point, is fighting back anymore. Um, as a, let's, let's have you play devil's advocate, since you, you do both types of law. As a, as a criminal defense attorney, what is your tact? And then as a civil rights attorney, what, what's your approach? OK, so now I am Chauvin's criminal defense attorney. Yes. Um, yes, he was doing exactly what he was trained to do. He was keeping control of a set of circumstances that he knew he did not have much control over. He had a crowd gathering around him. He had somebody who was acting weird in his opinion. We know that there was some toxicology that suggested that George Floyd may have been on some drugs. He will use that in, in his presentation of the bizarre way that Floyd was refusing to calm down, refusing to listen to his commands, do whatever. You know, the crowd gathering, the people sort of yelling at him. Um, you know, the idea that any, any interaction, any violent interaction with another person is a very stressful event. I, I talk about those stressful events when I talk about a self-defense event, mm -hmm. when someone is faced with deadly force or somebody coming at them, how the front part of your brain simply detaches and it truly does because only the back part of your brain, what we call the limbic system, or that real primitive part of your brain sort of takes over. So in that set of circumstances, although again, as an aside, eight and a half minutes is difficult, but with that set of circumstances where you're in a constant state of stress, focusing on gaining control over a person, um, that you weren't making rational or good decisions, particularly when looked at in the cold light of day, looking at a video a month or a year later, but during the moment that you're going through it, um, then that's gonna be his explanation for why he did what he did. Now, 
as a civil rights attorney, someone like Ben Crump, who would be saying the same exact thing. Um, this is an officer who uh, had previous interaction with Floyd, good or bad, he knew who he was. Um, there was no previous violence from Floyd, so we can't use that as a premise. Um, he had some animosity towards him, and he acted in a racially biased way. We all don't forget have implicit biases that we carry with us. If anyone believes that's not true, I invite you to take the Harvard implicit bias study uh, because it will prove to you that you have implicit biases because we all do. Um, so those implicit biases were there. They were not properly, quote, trained out of him. Chauvin instead gave in to those biases, decided that he had his own ego at stake at that point, the crowd telling him what to do, and he wasn't going to because he's the guy with the badge and the gun, and he's going to show them that he's in charge. He's going to get control over Floyd no matter what it takes, and he's going to keep him down there until he's absolutely certain, and he's going to, quote, teach him a lesson this time. Uh, and he's going to show him who's in charge. That seems to be what happened on that videotape when you look at it from an, either an outsider perspective, but certainly from a civil rights lawyer's perspective, that this was simply uh, tragically and horribly inappropriate, but that this was simply um, this guy's male ego as a cop who shouldn't have been a cop um, controlling a circumstance, not caring what he was doing to the neck that was under his knee, but just deciding that this was a battle he was not going to lose. I don't think that he looked at George's neck and said, I'm now going to kill you. I don't think that's what happened. But on the other hand, it didn't seem that he cared that it might be an outcome of his actions, because obviously that's exactly what did happen and look, this guy's a cop, he's an adult, um, he has responsibility for his actions, and I don't know how he's gonna walk in and say to anybody, uh, particularly a jury, in civil case or in this criminal case, that I did what I thought was right under the then existing circumstances, which is what he sort of would have to say, because nobody can look at that tape and say, what you did was reasonable. There was no fear. There, you look at Chauvin's, like you said, his body language. There was no, there wasn't any struggle. There wasn't any, you know, fighting for my life over his life. It was just, I'm going to, you know, stop you from breathing by putting my knee on your neck. Yeah, one of the things that it kind of reminds me of is the eggshell plaintiff argument in personal injury. Whereas, yeah. let's just say I get rear-ended by somebody at low, low mile per hour, no injuries. Now take somebody in their 70s who's had maybe several neck surgeries and they sustain a lot more damage than I do. Sure. Now, just because they're more fragile doesn't mean that the person who hit them is off the hook. So I'm I'm assuming, and let me know if I'm wrong, you know, just because George Floyd may have been under the influence of some drugs, that doesn't give Chauvin the right to to, to treat him the way he does and just expect that you know, an outcome that typically wouldn't happen didn't happen in this case. Is, is that an argument here? No, I think you're exactly right. Uh, we do take our plaintiffs, if you will, as we find them. And in this case, we take our citizen as Chauvin found him. Now, if George Floyd had continued to resist, if he was fighting and if we saw in the videotape, the arms flailing and the legs kicking and you know, the way you can sort of push yourself up and, and active resistance to Chauvin's attempt to control them. Because we have to start with the premise that I, I believe that Chauvin may have had a right to confront or to focus on Mr. Floyd. And he may have had a right to restrain him. He was investigating a potential um, a criminal charge. You're allowed to do that. I mean, don't forget, Cops exist because we hire them to keep us safe from each other. I mean, if you really take it down to it, that's what cops do, right? That's what law enforcement does. They protect us from each other. If we were nice to each other at all times, no crime, no cops. So he has a right to, um, to investigate a crime and to control the set of circumstances. Great. And if in doing so, he was actively resisted, we could even say that he was for the first minute or so maybe, um, great, but and he's allowed to control it. 
But once George Floyd stops that active resistance, then the use of force necessary to force compliance has to go down. And unfortunately, in Chauvin's case, it just, it seems, uh, and again, not to prejudge the case, that's what the jury is for, but it seems as though Chauvin never let up on what we know to be a potentially dangerous maneuver, even when George Floyd stopped resisting. He didn't seem to be resisting much, but at some point you can see not only a, a, a cessation of him stopping resisting, but he actually went unconscious. Mm -hmm. At that point, my God, I'm not sure how Chauvin would say, well, I, I thought maybe he was faking un being unconscious until I would, I don't know what he's going to say, but if I was the prosecutor cross-examining Chauvin on that, I would spend more time than, than he, he had his knee on his neck. I would spend on just the moment that it was obvious to everybody else looking at George Floyd that he was not any longer conscious as to why Chauvin didn't change his restraint maneuver. Right. Now, I know we're, we're only partially through jury selection, uh, so we haven't even started the case. We, we, we only know what we know through the media and video that we've seen. Uh, do you have any predictions of, of how things are going to go? Or um, you know, do you foresee any other of these bombshells that get dropped by either the defense or the, the state? Well, um... You, you never know about the bombshells. I mean, I don't think that anything, there's not going to be a Perry Mason moment in a, in a trial like this. I think, you know, both sides are very well prepared. They know what's coming in. They know for the most part what's being kept out. So I don't see somebody running in from the back of the courtroom. But, you know, having said that, Eric, I'm, I'm going to tell just if I might a 30 second war story to answer your question. I represented um, uh, a Sam DeBose was a guy up in Cincinnati who was shot by a University of Cincinnati police officer, um, a black guy, and the University of Cincinnati police officer was a white guy, shot him for a traffic stop. Um, I invite you to look at the video, make your own determination, but it just, it was a completely uh, unnecessary shooting. Uh, it, literally, the worst that, that my client, uh, Mr. DeBose, may have been doing was moving away from a traffic stop. He already knew who he was, he had his license, whatever. Um, and, they, and the officer, Tensing, shot him on body camera. And you see the car drive off because now my guy at that point had, had his head blown off and was dead already. And then you hear Tensing, the officer, sort of make up this defense of why he shot him. Well, he was trying to run me over and he did this and he's on the radio. Look at the video. And the reason why I say that is because they actually charged that officer with Sam's murder and they tried him in front of a jury for that and the jury hung. They could not convict him. Um, and we look at the video, I, I just, I almost implore you to look at it and, and email me to tell me what you think because I thought it was going to be a certain conviction. They tried him a second time in front of a new jury, and the new jury could not and would not convict him. They finally let him go. They didn't try him a third time. So in that case, it's not as egregious a video as we have in Mr. Floyd's case, um, because it didn't last as long. But again, the comparison to me is very similar because of having lived the, the Sam DeBose case. So I look at this case and say, well, my prediction is that he kept his knee on this guy's neck for eight minutes, didn't have to. He caused his death and he will be convicted of something. And, and I think that would be the proper, you know, rational outcome if we were a bunch of lawyers sitting around a table and saying, OK, what do you think about this? I would probably look at this. And all the other evidence, I haven't heard, you know, the defense case yet. But, mm -hmm. you know, that video is pretty tough to get around. But having said all of that, it is extraordinarily difficult to convict an, a law enforcement officer of anything in this country. It just, look at the numbers. Uh, even though it is creeping up, it is still extraordinarily difficult, even under the most egregious circumstances. 
So I would hazard a guess on this case that there may be one, don't forget a hung jury is one juror that doesn't say conviction, uh, that there may be one juror on that panel saying, you know, cops are here to do a job. It's a tough job we make them do. They make momentary decisions in the heat of the moment. I'm not gonna send this guy to prison for doing what we don't pay him enough to do. And if he did, did what he thought he was trained to do, then it's the agency's fault for not training him right. I'm just not gonna convict him. And seemingly that happened twice in the uh, Sandra Bose case. It, it just could happen here. Yeah, and uh, I mean, in my mind, just based on everything that I've seen, I, I would agree that there's gonna be some sort of uh, conviction any idea on second, third degree manslaughter? Yeah. And he could be charged with more than one. Yeah, so here's what here's the way uh, Minnesota law works. Um, their, their, the way they charge it, their sort of second degree is intent. So in Florida, premeditation and it's first degree. In, in Minnesota, what they say is, you definitely intended to cause the death, but you had no premeditation. I don't think that any understanding of the facts of this case as I know them today is that they're gonna be able to prove that Chauvin intended to cause George Floyd's death. Now, intend, of course, is a, a tough word. If I, if I grab you by the throat and cut off your breathing, am I intending your death? Oh, I'll, I'll say that I intended to grab you by the throat, but I didn't intend your death. You are responsible for the natural consequences of your action and that can lead to intent. So could it be their second degree? Yes, it could be, but at the very least, I would see the jury not going to that level of saying Chauvin caused, intended to cause the death of George Floyd. Rather, I think the third degree murder charge in Minnesota, which says, you know, if you evidence that ill will, that hatred, that absolute lack of care for human life. In Florida, we call that second degree um, murder. In Minnesota, it's third degree. And that basically says, it's not that you didn't intend, the, we agree you didn't intend the murder, but you were so disrespectful. You carry such ill will and hatred towards Mr. Floyd that you are responsible for his death and that would be a maximum of 25 years in prison. And if they come back with a conviction, um, my money would be that it would not be second degree, but it would be the third degree. More of a compromise um, is the manslaughter, which is basically, I didn't intend to cause your death. I didn't do anything. I, I don't dislike or hate you. Uh, I just acted so negligently that I should be responsible for my actions, which unfortunately and unintentionally led to your death. And that's sort of manslaughter. So it's gonna be manslaughter or their third degree murder if they come to a conviction. Okay. Well, Mark, I'd really like to thank you for your time here. Uh, I think our audience will enjoy your perspective. Like I said, it's a, a, neat, a unique one because of uh, your experience on, on both sides of the law here. So hopefully uh, as things progress, uh, you might be able to join us again and lend your perspective. Uh, that I think people are, a lot of people are interested in this case and to get a professional opinion like yours, I think is very Oh, helpful. sure, no, no problem. And I really do, I, I am sort of keeping track, so I'm not kidding about anyone who wants to take a time to look at that George, I'm sorry, Sam DuBose video, D-U-B-O-S-E. Uh, I'm not looking for business, but I am inviting you to email me at mark at omeralawgroup.com. I'd love to have your opinion on it. Uh, one of my most frustrating cases to watch that office would not be held accountable, but I may have, well, we all get trial hypnosis, right? I, I look at the video through my own eyes. I'd love to know other people's opinion concerning it. But other than that, whenever I can help or any other questions come up, Eric, you know, it's great to talk to you about these things. So yeah. look forward to seeing where the Chauvin case takes us. So do I. Thanks and again. I, I will just, I'm sorry. I will just end by, by a, a frustration point that I have because I do a lot of civil rights work. It's going to be very, I don't know how the black community will deal with a non-conviction in a case like this. I mean, they had a tough time with several of them, including the Zimmerman acquittal and some that have happened since. But this Chauvin case seems to be, you know, 
in Zimmerman, we had argument, we didn't have a video. In a case with a video, which just shows the death of a black man at the knee of a white police officer, if they don't get a conviction here, I don't know how the black community goes past this. I don't know how they maintain the faith we're asking all people, including the black community, to have in this system, still the best in the country, but with its own concerns. I don't know how they maintain faith in it if uh, if Chauvin walks on this one. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, just one quick question on your case. Did you have a chance to talk with any of the juries, uh, jurors yes. on that case and, and kind of get inside their head of why they acquitted? Uh, yeah, um, and it, very interesting because, you know, we had six women in Florida. It's only six for a non-capital case, a non-first degree. So we had six women. Um, and I talked to, I think, four, four of them. Uh, they were very willing to reach out to us and talk to us. And um, they, their thought was that it was pretty obvious to them. And there was one holdout juror for reasons not necessarily connected as well to true legal guilt. But there was one juror who just had a problem um, with the whole case. But the other ones that we did speak to were saying that to them that it was pretty clearly that under the circumstances that existed with all the forensic evidence that George acted in self-defense um, because again, the, the, the law in Florida as it is throughout the country with self-defense is the jury has to look at the sort of the facts as you were perceiving them. So in that case, as George was perceiving the facts, did he believe that he was in reasonable fear of great bodily injury? And the fact that um, he had a broken nose, the fact that, that his head was being hit on the concrete several times, uh, and the fact that it was undisputable that Trayvon Martin was on top of George when the shot was fired. We sort of know that because the, the shirt had the bullet through it and then it hit Trayvon's chest. So there was an obvious gap. Mm -hmm. um, those three facts, I think, were most compelling to the jury that George acted in self-defense. And that's what they sort of focused on when coming up with the acquittal. Right. Well, I'll tell you, we will post uh, this video along with uh, the other video uh, that you mentioned uh, where the cop, so that people can see both. I'm sure after they hear this, they're going to want to see that as a reference. Oh, I appreciate that. So uh, thank you again, Mark. Uh, okay, Eric. Have a good day, and we'll hopefully right. talk to you soon. I have a feeling we'll be talking soon about the next couple of maneuvers in the Chauvin case. So be well, and everyone stay safe. All right.